This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. For early Christians, the prologue to the Gospel of John inspired and demanded elaboration. Evoking Genesis, the prologue states, quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being, end quote. It's John 1, verses 1 to 3. The gospel continues a few verses later with, quote, and the word became flesh and lived among us, end quote. That's John 1, 14. This is the core of incarnation or enfleshment, and it conveys a pairing of creation and redemption that plays an important role in various expressions of Christology and soteriology. John's references to the word or logos as with God in the beginning and as an agent of creation who later became flesh exploded expectations of a purely or simply human Messiah, one anointed by God for set purposes of reconciliation or rule understood within a strictly historical scope. The Synoptic Gospels share in John's presentation of a thoroughly unexpected Messiah, and the very range of activities and characteristics ascribed to Jesus of Nazareth in the canonical Gospels confound in numerous ways. The Gospels do not simply present Jesus as divine. They also elaborate upon his humanity, even in its weakness and suffering. The Gospels present Jesus' anger, sadness, fear, and of course, his death on the cross. For early Christians, the Gospels presented as much a challenge as an opportunity. How can one coherently affirm the eternal creator was born in time, lived, grew, and died a gruesome death? How can one coherently affirm the swaddled babe was before all ages, governing the universe? This challenge was met with the affirmation that Jesus Christ as God incarnate is both fully divine and fully human. We will consider in a moment the difficulty of understanding how to conceptualize the full divinity and full humanity. First, it is worth noting that various thinkers, past and present, challenge in diverse ways, one or the other, the full divinity or the full humanity of Christ. Orthodox responses articulated intricate metaphysical frameworks for apprehending the incarnation and develop specific grammatical strategies for describing the incarnation. These frameworks and strategies, however, never presumed comprehension of the singular reality. Instead, they regarded the incarnation as a mystery. Within a theological register, the category of mystery denotes what surpasses human intellectual capacities without somehow being counter to or contrary to human reason. There is fruitful space for reflection between full comprehension and total incomprehension. Discovering comfort within that fruitful space is essential for Christological reflection. Any number of Christological errors arise from the presumption of or desire for greater comprehension than is possible or permissible. I wish to stress the sense of theological mystery when investigating the incarnation in order to weave together related strands of reflection or inquiry. There will be three basic parts to my talk tonight. First, I will briefly trace some early Christological debates and questions, focusing initially on Irenaeus of Lyon. This tracing will culminate in discussion of the Council of Chalcedon's definition of the faith from 451 a definition that established Christological orthodoxy. Second, I will turn to Anselm of Canterbury's Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Human, and its articulation of a satisfaction theory of atonement. Having sketched briefly Anselm's argument, we can reflect upon how the Chalcedonian formula underpins it. Third, I will offer a painfully concise summary of Thomas Aquinas on the incarnation's fittingness and on the good as self-diffusive. Along the way, I will make references or gestures toward the astounding breadth of material not even hinted at here. 
I should also note at the outset that aspects of his talk, talk are inescapably technical. I will try to walk slowly through the dark woods of technical terms and unfamiliar conceptual schemes. So part one, though contemporary challenges to Chalcedonian orthodoxy tend to question Christ's full divinity, some of the earliest controversies regarding the incarnation reflected an opposite impulse. A spectrum of second century thinkers argued that the word appeared in the flesh, but without possessing or being true flesh. Rather, the word's flesh was mere appearance or illusion. This position is known as docetism from the Greek verb dokein, meaning to seem or to appear. The impulse was noble, preserving the word's divinity from any taint of admixture with what is material and base. For docetists, the word could not truly be made flesh without ceasing to be divine or without somehow forfeiting impassibility, the inability to suffer, and they regarded the loss of divinity as absolutely untenable. The docetists reasoned the only way to preserve the word's divinity was for the word merely to appear in the flesh without taking on or becoming true flesh. The impulse was to separate the divine from the human realities of Jesus of Nazareth. Such a view preserves the word's immutability and impassibility, but at a rather high cost. Against the docetists, theologians such as Irenaeus of Lyon, who lived from about 130 to 200, argued for the concrete and historical particularity and actuality of the word's flesh. Just as importantly, Irenaeus stressed with equal vehemence that this entailed no diminution to the word's divinity. Irenaeus devoted substantial attention to Christology in his lengthy work against heresies. Beyond refuting what he considered the impoverished hermeneutics of the heretics, Irenaeus articulated a strategy for approaching or reconciling the gospel claims about Christ ranging from the grandest to the humblest. All these seemingly disparate statements refer to one and the same Jesus Christ. This becomes a crucial phrase in Christology, one and the same. Any attempt to divide Christ from Jesus, divine from human, as if the two cohabited or somehow existed in parallel, misses the point entirely. Irenaeus writes, quote, for Christ did not at that time descend upon Jesus, neither was Christ one and Jesus another, end quote. He later elaborates, there is, quote, one Christ Jesus who came by means of the whole dispensational arrangements and gathered together all things in himself. But in every respect, too, he is man, the formation of God. And thus, he took up man into himself the invisible becoming visible, the incomprehensible being made comprehensible, the impassable becoming capable of suffering, and the word being made man, thus summing up all things in himself. End quote. This clarification itself seems full of contradictions. The invisible made visible, the incomprehensible made comprehensible, the impassable made passable. How can these be maintained? Over the next centuries, multiple approaches arose to explain how one and the same Jesus Christ could be eternal and temporal, impassable and passable, glorious and humiliated. The attempts culminated or found resolution in the Council of Chalcedon's definition of the faith, which established Christological orthodoxy. Doing so required precision, and precision required the embrace of technical terminology at play in theological debates. There are many points to make here, but it will be best to read a section of the definition and then to comment upon it. So I'm gonna read a fairly long quotation from the Council of, Acts of the Council of Chalcedon, so bear with me. Here it begins. And so, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one voice teach to confess the one and same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and the same perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly human, of a reasoning soul and a body, 
of one substance with the Father, according to the divinity, and the same of one substance with us, according to the humanity. Through all things like us, except sin, begotten before the ages from the Father, according to the divinity, and in the last days, born for us and for our salvation from Mary, the virgin God-bearer, according to the humanity, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, understood in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, with the difference of the natures, at no point removed through the union, but rather the property of each nature preserved and coming together into a single person and a single subsistence, not dispersed or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, only begotten, God, Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the prophets beforehand, and He, our Lord Jesus Christ, taught about Himself and as the creed of our fathers teaches. End quote. There is much to comment upon in this dense passage. The language of one and the same stands out, but equally evident are the attempts to ensure the affirmation of one and the same Jesus Christ does not invalidate, undermine, cancel, or somehow prevent any and all duality. How, though, to name what is one and what is dual? Chalcedon affirms a single person, a single prosopon, and a single subsistence or hypostasis in Christ. While person and subsistence name what is one, Chalcedon affirms this one and the same Christ to be understood in two natures. And the word for nature that it uses here is usia. We'll encounter later a different Greek word for nature. Chalcedon specified that the two natures in Christ, divine and human, were united in the one hypostasis or person of the word. The question was, how? The Chalcedonian definition qualifies the union as in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Grammatically, these phrases are four negative adverbs in the original Greek. When pressed to explain how the two natures are united, the definition of Chalcedon stipulates four ways in which they are not united. We should linger over these four negative adverbs. Without confusion indicates that the two natures, divine and human, are united to each other without becoming some new or third thing, a tertium quid in the technical phrasing of this. Some tertium quid that would be a mixture of the two, some strange semi-divine cocktail. Likewise, without change, clarifies that each nature retains what is proper to it. The union does not change the individual natures into new things. Without division, prevents any splitting or splintering of the whole. The two natures are truly united in the one person of the word and do not divide the person of the word. Without separation, eliminates anything less than a true union, any mere juxtaposition or indwelling or show of favor. To recap, the two natures are united without becoming a new type of thing, without themselves undergoing a substantial change into something new, without carving up the person of the word into parts, and without any distance between the natures, as if they were merely in proximity to one another. So these four negative adverbs guard against what were considered pernicious Christological errors, misguided attempts to comprehend fully a theological mystery. At the same time, the very grammatical form of these adverbs aims to preserve that theological mystery as mystery. As precisely how the two natures are united in one person, the definition const confidently responds, not in this way, not in that way. The Greek term translated as definition is horos, which can also mean limit. The Chalcedonian formula defines or sets boundaries around the permissible field of reflection. The space for orthodox reflection or speculation on the incarnation is constrained by Chalcedon, but the definition serves as a generous restraint. We can imagine the definition as a fence. Fences can keep things out or in, 
and for various reasons, not all generous. If we imagine a cliff, it is not difficult to consider how a fence could add a most useful measure of safety, especially in the dark. It prevents anyone accidentally and perilously tumbling over the edge. Just to reiterate, we can summarize Chalcedonian orthodoxy as follows. One and the same Jesus Christ is the one person of the word or logos existing in two natures, the divine nature and human nature, united without change, confusion, division, or separation. Subsequent centuries would bring further elaborations or specifications of the consequences of the Chalcedonian definition. These elaborations and specifications answered new challenges arising from various criticisms of Chalcedon by so-called non-Chalcedonian Christians. Cyril of Alexandria, who lived from 376 to 444, emphasized unity and identity through the confession of one nature, Miaphusis, of Christ incarnate. Cyril died some seven years before the Council of Chalcedon, but his followers were divided as to whether the Chalcedonian formula confirmed or deviated from Cyril's Christological convictions. Eventually, debate shifted from the expression miaphusis to other terms or categories to express the asymmetrical unity and duality in Christ. These terms or categories included the number of energies and operations in Christ. Debates about these categories came to be known as the monenergist and monothelite controversies. The Third Council of Constantinople settled these controversies in 681 by affirming in Jesus Christ two natural energies and operations. Constantinople III argued for two energies and operations because energy and operation pertain to nature rather than to person. In other words, Chalcedon established for subsequent reflection a basic logic according to which whatever pertains to person was one in Christ and whatever pertains to nature was dual. Among other things, this Chalcedonian logic allows for robust and rich scriptural interpretation. I want to stress this because some would read the Chalcedonian definition with a degree of wariness or even suspicion. The Gospels do not employ the language of hypostasis, usia, or phusis. So why are these appropriate or licit terms? When asked why he resorted to non-biblical terminology, the third century theologian Origen of Alexandria quipped that it was because heretics were always finding new ways to misread the scriptures. A similar idea pertains here. The Chalcedonian definition serves as a guide to reading scripture rather than an external overlay or imposition. How does one reconcile the lofty and lowly affirmations of Christ in the New Testament? The Chalcedonian definition and its subsequent elaborations provide a conceptual framework for such work of reconciliation. The conceptual framework is in some sense metaphysical and in some sense linguistic. The definition of Chalcedon affirms that the property or idiotetos of each nature is preserved and comes together in a single person. This can seem to stretch to the breaking point, our normal way of speaking, and if not recognized precisely for what it is, can result in confusion or apparent contradiction. This idea came to be known as the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of properties. The communicatio idiomatum allows for expressions such as God suffers without conceding that the divine nature is passable. This relates to the meaning of nature and of person. The person is the underlying metaphysical and grammatical subject of the natures. This means that whatever is true of either nature can be said of the person in some respect. What this does not mean is that whatever is true of one nature is true of the other nature. So what does this look like in practice? The divine nature is impassable, and in so in some obvious sense, God is impassable. Nonetheless, in virtue of the incarnation, it is permissible to say God suffers or God is passable because the subject God in these expressions is the fully divine person of the word bearing a passable and suffering human nature. 
It is impermissible, however, to say God the Father suffers or that the divine nature suffers. Affirming that God suffers does not mean that the divine nature suffers, that every divine person suffers, or that the divine person of the word suffers in respect to divinity. We say Christ suffers rather than Christ's human nature suffers because we ascribe to the person suffering rather than merely to the nature. Human nature is passable or capable of suffering, but common human nature does not act or suffer. Individuals do. Complex rules developed to govern what can be termed concrete and abstract predications. I will not delve into those here, but it is important to note this concrete and abstract uh, distinction as something that is particularly important for the history of Christological reflection. With this background exploration of Christological orthodoxy and the union in Christ complete, we can turn to Anselm of Canterbury's Cur Deus Homo. So now for part two. Irenaeus stressed the pairing of creation and redemption. The focus here rests on creation through the word according to a reasonable, logical, and orderly matter, manner. The disorder of sin necessitated a reordering. And so who better than the word through whom all things were created to restore that order? Irenaeus often used more specific imagery to focus on the reformation or recreation of humanity through the incarnation. He presented the logos or the word as the model or exemplar for the creation of humanity, stamping or forming that lump of clay like a seal on wax, exposed to the elements, say for example, the heat of the sun or of sin, the wax softens, begins to lose its form. How can the likeness impressed upon the form at creation be restored? Bringing back the original model to reform the likeness where it is deteriorating. This approach perhaps aids in understanding an incarnation, but it hardly clarifies why the story of the incarnation, why this reformation of disordered humanity would include the crucifixion. Anselm of Canterbury sought to sketch an answer. Anselm lived from about 1033 until 1109. His work, Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Human, is a dialogue between himself and Basso. Cur Deus Homo famously articulates a satisfaction theory of atonement. Anselm's satisfaction theory of atonement frames sin and redemption as a transaction between God and humanity. The significance of a satisfaction theory rests in part in what it denies or refuses. One common idea or image from earlier centuries focused on human beings as in legal servitude to the devil through sin. The payment was death. According to this framework, Christ as sinless did not owe the debt of death, but freely chose death. Greedy for the prize, Satan unjustly grasped or snatched at Christ's soul thereby undoing any rights previously held on humanity. Satisfaction theory differs from this, but also differs from something called penal substitution theory, according to which a penalty for sin was owed by humanity and that Christ could substitute for humanity in paying that penalty. Anselm's satisfaction theory of atonement employs many of the same terms and ideas, but removes the devil from the equation. The incarnation and crucifixion do not ransom humanity from legal servitude or other, all, otherwise offer payment to the devil or merely substitute for humanity. Anselm's treatise purports to demonstrate the necessity of the incarnation and to do so while bracketing what is known from scripture. It is important to stress from the outset that Anselm's bracketing of scripture is questionable and that it is generally clear that he does not intend to demonstrate the necessity of the incarnation in a vacuum, but rather to explore and explain the reasonableness of the incarnation to those already disposed toward faith. Anselm was not trying to prove faith. Two justly famous phrases from Anselm reinforce this. Credo unt intelligam, I believe so that I may understand, or I believe in order to understand, 
and fides quarens intellectum, faith seeking understanding, Anselm employed these phrases to qualify his own theological project. They serve equally as guiding principles for his efforts and as interpretive principles for his readers. Anselm's abiding disposition towards theological reflection involved diligent and rational investigation of matters transcending human intellectual capacities. So, knowing that Anselm rejects redemption as a transaction with the devil or a simple substitution, and that he frames his investigation of the incarnation as an exercise in faith seeking understanding, why is the incarnation? a reasonable response to sin. Anselm takes it for granted that the incarnation responds to sin. The question is simply how and why this way. How does the incarnation answer the problem of sin? At its most fundamental level, Anselm characterizes sin as arising from and through disobedience. The proper remedy for this ill, the most effective means of repairing the harm of disobedience, is through obedience. Obedience cannot be restored through an intermediary. Humanity disobeyed, and humanity must obey. This simple observation from Anselm leads to a rather complex series of reflections. Anselm's argument can seem deceptively simple when viewed from a schematic perspective. But for all his efforts to construct carefully a linear and logical argument, Anselm's Cur Deus Homo resists simple summary at almost every turn. That speaks against treating it here, but there are other and good reasons to do so. If for nothing else, Anselm's Cur Deus Homo is a giant upon whose shoulders subsequent texts and authors have stood. It remains a pivotal work and unsurpassed within its own parameters. Anselm sets forth the following three basic premises for his argument. The first, is that human beings were created for happiness, but that happiness cannot be possessed in this life when there is sin. He later specifies that, quote, rational nature was created just in order to be happy through enjoying the supreme good, end quote. So this is the created purpose of humanity. Second premise, happiness requires the remission or forgiveness of sins. Third basic premise, no one passes through the present life without sin. These premises or conditions set the basic parameters of the argument. Since human beings were created for happiness, abandoning sinful humanity to its own condemnation, misery, and despair would thwart the divine intention in the very creation of humanity. So again, we see a pairing of creation and redemption. Were humanity not to achieve its created end of happiness in the enjoyment of the supreme good, the plan of creation would be disordered. Restoration of fallen humanity does not merely serve the good of humanity, but also of the larger providential plan of creation. The first two premises or conditions clarify this. The third premise frames the difficulty of restoration. Human beings mired in sin cannot themselves achieve restoration. At the same time, obedience cannot be restored by another. The two conditions create a seemingly insoluble dilemma. Before investigating Anselm's resolution of the dilemma, it is worth taking a brief detour through Anselm's understanding of sin. This will clarify precisely why obedience cannot be restored by another. Anselm remarks, quote, to sin is nothing other than not to give God what is owed, end quote. So the question is, what is owed to God? According to Anselm, absolutely everything, every thought, every action, everything is owed to God without remainder. God does not need anything from human beings, but human beings need everything from God. This all-encompassing dependence means that what we think and do and are is owed to God. Through the disobedience of sin, humanity fails to give God what is owed. This failure creates a debt. Anselm specifies this as a debt of honor. Failure to give God what is owed dishonors God 
or even robs God's honor. The theft does not truly damage God or diminish God's actual honor. It damages and diminishes humanity, which becomes mired in its own disobedience and debt. The crime cries out for punishment to maintain justice, and death restores justice by punishing sin. Yet that preservation of justice through punishment does not restore humanity to its intended end. Anselm amplifies the problem by reflecting on the magnitude or enormity of sin and on humanity's inability to repay even the most trivial of debts. We can begin with human inability. Since humanity owes everything to God, there is no reserve, nothing extra that humanity could ever give to repay a debt. Again, it matters not how minuscule the debt. All that could be given is already owed. The debt of honor from human disobedience is in addition to and in excess of what is already owed. But what more could be given than everything? Sin lands humanity in an inescapable predicament, even at its best. The situation, however, is far worse, and for two reasons. The first is that repaying the debt of honor requires something greater, aliquid maius, than the stolen honor. Simple restitution, even if possible, would not suffice. Giving back what was stolen could never alone suffice. It could not respect or reflect the harm of the theft itself. That harm can only be righted. Humanity can only be restored by something greater. The second reason why the human condition is so dire concerns the enormity of sin. To convey this, Anselm sets up a thought experiment. Imagine a scenario in which all of creation, all that exists other than God, was in jeopardy of perishing and being brought to nothing. Imagine further that you could prevent this decreation, that you could preserve all that is in existence with a single glance in one direction. Now imagine even further that God commanded against that single glance. Well, what is worth more? For Anselm, it is absolutely clear and definite. Real obedience is a rational being freely willing the divine will. Disobeying the will of God with the merest glance is far worse than letting all of creation dissolve to nothing. Stated otherwise, the value of God's honor exceeds the value of all creation. So, what is the magnitude of sin? It is more than the whole of what is. That is the debt owed. Reassembling these points, we can grasp the fundamental problem as the Anselm sees it. The disobedience of sin has created a debt of astounding magnitude. Restoring humanity and fulfilling the created order requires paying this debt through obedience. Humanity already owes everything to God and lacks any resources for paying the smallest of debts. This debt steals God's honor, which is worth more than the world. If humanity cannot pay the most trifling of debts, how could it ever repay a debt of such magnitude and to repay it with something greater? In fact, what is something greater than the universe? The first glimmer of hope comes when Anselm acknowledges one circumstance in which a human being could offer something in excess of what is already owed. A sinless human being would not owe death. Were there a sinless human being who could voluntarily accept death in obedience to the divine will, that act of voluntary acceptance would exceed what is owed. In the technical terminology, it would be a supererogatory act. Even granting this hopeful acknowledgement, there still remains Anselm's premise that no one passes through this life without sin, and that even such an act would face the hurdle of providing something greater than the debt of sin, a debt of greater magnitude than the universe itself. Since nothing within the universe could be greater than the whole of the universe, the only agent with the capacity to offer something greater is God.
God bears infinite value. Omnipotent acts surpass all limits. God's omnipotent acts are something greater than creation as a whole. The conclusion to draw from this for Anselm is that God, and God alone, is able to make satisfaction for humanity's debt of honor incurred through the disobedience of sin. Though this seems reassuring, the catch is that only humanity ought to make satisfaction for the debt of honor incurred through the disobedience of sin. Only a sinless human being could produce a supererogatory act, but no human act could equal the something greater owed. Anselm's reasoning brings his dialogue partner Basso to the brink of despair, and only then, when confronted with the abyss separating divine ability and human obligation, does Anselm reveal the unimaginably clever solution. The only possibility for satisfaction, given these constraints, is the Deus Homo, the God human. Again, Anselm is bracketing scripture and so employs the expression Deus Homo rather than naming Jesus. One and the same individual must be fully divine and fully human. The only way for this to happen is for two natures to be united in one person. Here we can return to Chalcedon and reflect on the power of the Chalcedonian formula and approach. For Anselm, satisfaction for sin and the restoration of humanity are only possible given something like a Chalcedonian Christology. Everything hinges upon this. Any Christology that did not preserve the full divinity and full humanity of Christ could not meet Anselm's standards for ability and obligation. Chalcedon affirms the property of each nature preserved in the union. The properties of human nature include passibility, the ability to suffer, though death is not natural to humanity in its sinless state. Human nature does not require passibility. The requirement followed as a consequence of sin. Yet even prior to the fall, human nature had the capacity to suffer. The significance of this is that the person of the word could assume a perfect human nature, perfect in the sense of without fault and complete. And this perfect human nature would not suffer of necessity as a punishment, but could suffer according to the word's will. At the same time, the word remained fully divine, and Christ possessed the divine nature with its omnipotence. As Anselm notes, the Deus Homo is omnipotent and can freely die in obedience to give honor to God. The life and person of the Deus Homo are of infinite value. They are more lovable than sins are odious. The free gift of this life surpasses all sin. The free gift of the Deus Homo's life is something greater than the debt of honor incurred through the disobedience of sin and allows for human happiness while preserving divine justice. There could be no happiness without justice. There could be no justice without satisfaction. There could be no satisfaction without the Deus Homo, freely willing death, as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of humanity. The inevitable conclusion for Anselm is that purely rational analysis reflects or supports the revealed dispensation, namely that the person of the Son of the Word became incarnate for the sake of human salvation, employing the divine power to pay the debt of sin through the supererogatory act of a free sacrifice. Anselm's argument is more intricate than summarized here, but this provides some sense of the larger arc of the cur deus homo. Anselm presents the incarnation as necessary for human salvation, given a specific framing and in an attempt to demonstrate the reasonableness of the incarnation. Now I'm going to turn to the third part and speak very briefly about Thomas Aquinas, who learned much from Anselm, but returns in a way to some of the basic insights of Irenaeus. So Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1255 to 1274, begins the Summa Theologiae's analysis of the Incarnation with the question whether it was fitting that God should become incarnate. The category of fittingness, or convenientia, plays a crucial role in the Summa's Christology, allowing Thomas a means for exploring and explaining 
the wisdom of the incarnation. This, in a sense, reprises aspects of early debates about the incarnation, as well as Anselm's reflections on the reasonableness of the incarnation. In defending the incarnation's fittingness, Thomas makes reference to Paul's famous text from Romans 120, that the invisible things of God are made known through the visible. The incarnation makes visible God's goodness, wisdom, justice, and power. These four categories all play important roles in Thomas's Christology, beginning with goodness. Thomas clarifies fittingness in two basic ways. First, the fitting designates what corresponds to the very nature of something. Let's linger over this just for a second. It pertains to the nature of birds to fly. It pertains to the nature of fish to swim. It is fitting for fish to swim and for birds to fly. It is not fitting for fish to fly under most circumstances, and it's not fitting for at least many species of birds to swim. When things do something that, that is proper to their own nature, that is fitting. The very nature of God is goodness. And so Thomas argues, quote, it belongs to the essence of goodness to communicate itself to others, end quote. Becoming incarnate reflects the fullest self-communication possible, and so is perfectly fitting to God. The idea of the good as self-diffusive is a medieval development of earlier views. When applied to the incarnation, it reprises an idea seen already in Irenaeus, namely the pairing of creation and redemption. The foundational self-communication of divine goodness is the act of creation from nothing. Created reality exists insofar as it participates in the gift of being, and the diversity of created realities existing within an ordered whole reflects divine goodness and wisdom. The second basic manner in which Thomas presents fittingness concerns how something is done. Thomas addresses this when questioning whether the incarnation was necessary for human restoration. His reply is that yes, the incarnation was necessary for human restoration, but only in one sense of necessity. It was not an absolute necessity or a sine qua non. No absolute necessity could constrain divine omnipotence. God could have restored human nature through other means. And this point is crucial for Thomas. Thomas acknowledges a second sense in which something is necessary for achieving an end. In this second way, things are necessary when they allow for the end to be achieved better and more fittingly. Thomas provides the example of a horse as necessary for a long journey. The journey could be made by foot or even if needed by crawling, but the journey would be much easier by a horse. A horse is not absolutely necessary for a long journey, but the journey can be made better and more fittingly with a horse. The incarnation was necessary, according to Thomas, in that it represents the best and most fitting means for the restoration of human nature. Thomas expands upon this by listing five ways the incarnation promotes furtherance in the good and five ways it promotes withdrawal from evil. The fittingness of the incarnation reflects the divine wisdom in communicating the fullness of the divine goodness most efficaciously. The incarnation was not absolutely necessary for human restoration because God's omnipotence labors under no constraints. There had always been an understanding that the incarnation resolved the problem of sin, and the question had traditionally been how it did so and why it was the appropriate resolution. In Thomas's framing, it was fitting according to God's nature, but not necessary according to God's nature. It was necessary in the sense of fitting because it best promotes humanity in the good and remo removes humanity from evil. The incarnation's fittingness with respect to God as the self-diffusive good might seem to imply God would have become incarnate even had there been no sin. There are other reasons for suspecting this. In his treatment of grace, Thomas investigates extensively the workings of grace and its effects. Grace serves two basic functions, healing and elevating. Thomas distinguishes natural goods and supernatural goods within this discussion. Accomplishing natural goods 
lies within the power of human nature. In its created state, humanity would need no additional assistance beyond its natural capacities to accomplish all manner of natural goods. After the fall, however, sin damages and impairs human nature, preventing its natural capacities from accomplishing these goods. Grace heals human nature by working within the human will to make it effective in willing natural goods. Grace heals by restoring human nature's intended capacities for willing the good within the scope of its natural parameters. Grace also elevates. Thomas's point here is that the life of blessedness, the beatific vision of God, exceeds natural human capacities. Humanity is created for and called to an end above itself. Achieving that end requires the elevation of grace. Grace elevates the human will as a cooperative cause of this supernatural effect. Humanity could never achieve this supernatural end of the beatific vision without grace's elevation. So grace heals or restores, and it elevates. The highest communication of grace unfolds with the incarnation, with the assumption of human nature into hypostatic or personal union. Had there been no sin, there would have been no need for grace to heal or restore fallen humanity. Had there been no sin, grace would still have been necessary for the elevation of humanity to a supernatural end. Scholastic theologians took great interest in examining questions from many angles, and this led to a host of counterfactual questions. One such question was, would God have become incarnate had there been no sin? Some argued yes, and this position has come to be associated with a number of Franciscan theologians. Exploring these views and arguments would take us too far afield, so please let it suffice for now to note that some argued God would have become incarnate had there been no sin, but would not have suffered. Thomas agrees with many points in favor of such a co conclusion. His remarks on the necessity for elevating grace apart from sin and on the self-diffusion or, or communication of divine goodness reaching its zenith in the incarnation might easily suggest that God would have become incarnate apart from sin. Thomas, however, preserves a more reserved approach. He affirms that God could have become incarnate apart from sin, but he argues it is better to say God would not have become incarnate had there been no sin. His reasoning is that scripture everywhere presents the incarnation in relation to sin. Scripture provides no warrant for speculation into theological mysteries or to counterfactual scenarios, since human beings cannot comprehend or predict what depends solely upon the divine will. For Thomas, this question is not about God's nature or about human needs in other circumstances. It is simply about the permissible limits for human speculation into theological mysteries. What this all means is that when confronted with the question, why God became human, Thomas lists a wealth of reasons. Some re reasons relate to sin, others do not. The existence of reasons for the incarnation apart from sin, however, does not warrant affirmation of what God would have done had there been no sin. For Thomas, one must instead humbly wonder at the mystery. Now we can briefly recap some of the chief points we have sketched. The gospel portrayals of Jesus include elements both lofty and lowly. Theologians debated how to combine, harmonize, or explain the glorious and the gory in gospel accounts. Against those who might deny either element or to partition them from each other, Irenaeus stressed that they were all true of one and the same Jesus Christ. This refrain of one and the same echoed through the centuries and received greater conceptual framing at the Council of Chalcedon. Chalcedon stressed the duality of Christ's perfect natures together with the singularity of subject in Christ. Chalcedon's conceptual framing resisted over-specification, ultimately explaining how Christ's two natures were united through negative descriptions, without change, confusion, division, or separation.
Anselm's attempt to explain why God became human reflects a Chalcedonian approach. The reality of sin creates a dilemma only solved by the Deus Homo, who unites ability and obligation in one subject. Only the Deus Homo can perform a supererogatory act of sufficient value to satisfy humanity's debt. Though Anselm frames the Curdeus Homo as a demonstration of the incarnation's necessity on logical grounds, his broader commitment to theology as fides quarens et electum, faith seeking understanding, suggests his intent in the Curdeus Homo is to demonstrate the incarnation as a reasonable solution to the problem of sin. Whereas Anselm concentrated on the passion, Thomas Aquinas approached the incarnation from a broader perspective. The chief reason Thomas provides to explain the fittingness of the incarnation is that it pertains to the very nature of the good to communicate itself, and that it pertains to the very nature of the supreme good to communicate itself supremely. Though this might suggest the incarnation inevitably follows from God as the supreme good, Thomas opts for a more cautious approach. Since scripture everywhere frames the incarnation as a remedy for sin, Thomas holds it would exceed epistemic warrant to affirm beyond revelation what God would have done had there been no sin. So I appreciate your attention and your patience and would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you so much. uh, I have a a question regarding uh, the understanding of of grace uh, from Thomas's idea. So um, how would Thomas respond to uh, Martin Luther's notion of grace being like snow covering a pile of of manure being human nature? So he talks uh, about the the nature uh, repairing or redeeming part of our nature and making us... uh, better again, how would he correct Luther? Yeah, so so for Aquinas, um, he really wants to stress that humanity, like other creatures, uh, um, possess what he calls the dignity of causality. And so what he always wants to stress is that it's part of the, the fittingness of the incarnation. And this is a particular means of communicating grace that... Um, that it works internally within human beings. And so this is a major difference between Protestants and Catholics and the Reformation is the the idea that for many Protestants, redemption and and the grace of redemption remained external to the human being. Uh, Sometimes this was in forensic theories of justification. Sometimes it was framed as if, you know, when God looked at the... uh, um, the predestined to salvation, what he saw was Jesus. And when he looked at the predestined to damnation, he saw them for themselves. But for Thomas Aquinas, it's not just a, a stand in for someone. Grace actually works internally within human beings to reform them. So it's, it's not, you know, a, a, a candy shell with a rotten center. It's that the, the very grace works internally within human beings cooperating with them as they cooperate with it in, in many of its forms to, to restore them and to elevate them. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my question is a little bit more on like the practical side. I know you went really deep into some theology and philosophy, but um, I know at one point you mentioned the fact that like as humans, we are like, no one can go through life without sin. Correct. So, this is, this is Anselm's view. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. And in that way, then, how would he respond to if God, if Jesus was also truly human, why didn't, why was he never, why why did he never sin? Like if that was part of the definition of human, how would that have, like how that would have worked? So so this is where, you know, when we, when he talked about how he, Anselm says he's uh, proceeding as if all that was known from revelation is bracketed. But then he sets up this premise, you know, based on this idea of fallen humanity, and he subscribes to a traditional idea of the the um, transmission of original sin. And so the the he would subscribe to he has a fairly complicated bit um, about how uh, Jesus can be born through um, through the virgin birth, and and that Mary can be uh, 
he's, he's, his sinless human nature can be born, preserved from the taint of original sin uh, in sort of supratemporal expectation of his uh, atoning sacrifice. So it, it, there kind of gets to be this, this uh, strange temporal bit of this in Anselm, but he basically wants to say, Mary can, uh, um, he doesn't have yet the full doctrine of the immaculate, Mary's immaculate conception, which would develop later, but he has this idea that Mary could be completely absolved of all sin prior to Jesus's conception and Jesus is conceived of the Holy Spirit and so can be born apart from sin. And that's the one special example. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so I recently got a question in, in a Bible study. We were looking at the episode where God comes to Abraham and specifically comes to Sarah and tells Sarah in particular that she'll have a son. A, um, a Protestant friend said that this would have been Jesus coming before his incarnation. Now, I know that that's not correct, but I, I don't know in fullness why that is not correct. Because of course, like the, incar the incarnation was timed, of course, but yeah, why, is, how, how would you refute that? Well, I don't know if there's um, exactly much to refute and I don't know what this individual would be particularly thinking. That That's not a view I've ever heard in a concrete way like that. Um, one of the general approaches to uh, scriptural hermeneutics that especially many early Christians developed and, and this echoed through the Middle Ages is that they were um, presenting how instances of, say, uh, theophanies to Abraham were foreshadowings of later realities in the New Testament. So in the uh, um, proclamation of, of the birth of Isaac to Sarah, it's meant to be this uh, foreshadowing, this you know, dim prediction in certain respects of, of a miraculous birth that would come later. And it, that usually reaches its sort of crescendo in the, in the idea of the sacrifice of Isaac. So that Abraham is willing on this part of obedience to, to sacrifice his son. And that, that is then foreshadowing is presented in John 3.16 of, of the similar language of then the father allowing his, his son to become incarnate and suffer for others to undergo death uh, in obedience. And so those are parallels that are always set up, but that parallel isn't meant to say that, you know, the, the, that Isaac is in fact uh, Jesus or, or somehow God incarnate. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Earlier when you are talking about, um, uh, the, the councils uh, of Chalcedon uh, and and talking about the uh, the ideas of monothelitism and mono, monophysitism, and you were talking about how uh, since Cyril of Alexandria ta uh, taught about me the miaphysite uh, the miaphysite nature of of Christ, um, <clears throat> and how there's a distinction now between how uh, the Catholic and the Orthodox uh, Orthodox churches. Uh, understand how the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church and the churches of the East look at it. Um, so what would be uh, the East's uh, response to us claiming that they are monophysite instead of miaphysite? What is, what is their, their notion of the difference? Yeah, so um, um, the prefix mono means what in Greek means one, but it's one in a sort of restrictive sense only one and Mia is one in a little bit of a less restrictive sense. It's kind of hard to explain the shadings of these in, in English. So part of this, this came down to the distinction between mono and Mia and, and they're different, more restrictive and more generous uh, um, sayings. And it also just came down to uh, the meaning of phusis as it relates to usia or hypostasis and, and prosopon. And so when theologians were first beginning to uh, engage in these Christological debates, and this especially goes back to the Cappadocian fathers and Gregory of Nazianzus in particular, these didn't have stable or set meanings. So sometimes many thinkers would, would use these uh, terms somewhat interchangeably. And as they realized the need to speak about theological matters with greater precision, then they began to stipulate some of the definitions. 
Uh, this is particularly true of hypostasis and usia. And so what one thing that was at the of a, the you could say the very nature of the debate um, of later the the non calcedonian Christians in response to to Chalcedon was how did that phrase miaphusis, how did that fit into this Chalcedonian scheme of what was one and what was dual? And so some would interpret Cyril as his um framing of one nature of the incarnate Lord was another way of uh, expressing what Chalcedon was trying to say in the negative adverbs of without division or without separation. This trying to say that this is one, you know, metaphysical unity, but that metaphysical unity wasn't sort of a simple unity, you know, and so that would be the distinction. There are um, other Cyrillite Christians, Miafusite and non-Chalcedonian Christians, who think that the Chalcedonian um, formula of allowing, saying that Jesus is not simply from two natures, but in two natures, uh, still um, unnecessarily and unhelpfully divides.